This is one of a, of a continuing series of lectures uh, that is brought to you by the Marilyn Hoffman Program on Chemicals and Health that, that Professor Gil Brain and I uh, co-direct, uh, along with some very uh, capable uh, research associates. Uh, and we've been bringing a series of speakers here uh, to campus. Uh, some spend uh, several days with us. We we're delighted that that's the case with Torben Sissigar. Torben is a physician from our house university. That's not your house, that's our house university. <laughs> we have a little play on that, sorry. Uh, in Denmark, a wonderful area of, uh, of the world, uh, and we've known each other for many years. His background is, is in medicine, occupational medicine, uh, environmental medicine, and just today I continue to learn new facets about uh, my friend that I have known so well, but we were meeting with the health department at the city of Cambridge. And he said, I too was a city doc. So in his past, uh, when he graduated from medical school, he served as a city health official. And we had a great conversation about the issues that we face. I mean, they're so common, it's just human habitation. Uh, and what's going on in Cambridge, and what's going on and from his experience, and is going on in, in Denmark. But uh, Torben, over the last five years, led this nationwide study, multi-institutional study in Denmark, about health and housing. And so we think of housing, and gee, where in the world would housing you think would be really good? And you think of the, Nor the Norway and Finland and Sweden and Denmark because they've had programs on indoor environments for so long, but yet problems exist and continue to exist. And it's often an opportunity for new research, new investigations. Uh, and uh, you're going to share some of that experience and other uh, things that you've been working on uh, with us. So, uh, Torben. Hi, Sam. Thanks for coming. I was just saying, I don't know if you heard it, that we're just meeting with you and your staff, sharing these problems of living, right? In we urban solve settings. everything. Yeah, we solve everything. everything. It's great. Right. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Joe, for inviting me to, this, uh, to give this talk. It's a bit exciting to be here talking about experiments, but um, Jack picked the topic that I'm talking about, and it's about, about human experiments. So we have been doing a lot of human experiments at the Institute for many, many years. And that will be my major talk. But I'm also doing other things. And I'm happy to meet people from all, all around the world that I know, from Tsinghua and from Beijing and from, from Howard and from Mexico. So I'm really thrilled to be here, to, uh, yeah, sharing with you what I've been studying for the last many years. I'm from Aarhus. And as the song says, you're always welcome at our house. And so, so please, if you come by, we'll serve for you. Um, but this is the group, just to, uh, I have not been doing this alone. And we have a group working in the, in the chamber. And this is Christmas greeting from Denmark to you all. Um, and um, this is, these are the facilities, and we just have them renovated for a number of millions um, to make the chambers up to date. There are so many gadgets here, so I'm using the wrong ones when I'm trying to, to, to change them. So I will talk about the experimental studies in the chambers, and you can see this is a long list of what we have been doing. We started with VOCs, actually with formaldehyde. The, the chambers were started because of the cheap oil problem we saw in Denmark in, in the late 60s. And, and my, uh, my the professor before me, Ip Andersen, he, he was wondering what was happening when people had symptoms in the indoor area, in, in dwellings in, in Aarhus. Uh, and they started looking and they found out that it was related to new buildings and in the new buildings they saw a lot of chipboard and they were then gradually coming to that there might be something in the chipboard and then they put the chipboard in a, in, a, in a box and measured the headspace of the chipboard and then they found out there was a lot of matter and that was actually the start of looking at all this. Uh, so uh, they worked with that in the beginning and then we went from uh, via EMFs and, and then to, to dust and we've been working a lot with dust the last few years, mainly house dust and, and, and combination of that with 
with other elements in, in, the, in the environment and wood smoke lately. And, and the last study was on pollen, pollen and, uh, and, and uh, in the chamber. Um, so we're doing, we're doing control trials in, 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 these, uh, in these facilities and we're doing randomized controlled blindness studies because this is kind of the, uh, the way to do this. And uh, we, because we are blinded, we don't know what people are exposed to, and that's sometimes a problem to keep it blinded, like with the wood smoke, where we, we had problems blinding the, the smoke in itself. But after some time, we, uh, there was a, a slight smell of smoke in the whole facility <laughs> because we were running this, this wood stove every day. Uh, and um, then we had running also when we had a, no, a, a smoke-free day in the chamber. So at least when they went into the chamber, they didn't know. The other thing we do is that we uh, let people in the chamber, and then after, during the first 30 minutes, we raise the increase, or we increase the concentration of the of the compound that we're using, in order also to mask the concentration. Because if you are gradually uh, introduced to this smell, you won't acknowledge it. So it's. But that, that's the problem to the blinding because the technicians going in and out, they, they really feel the smell when it's there. So these are the, the exposure facilities. We have this, uh, this building. It was actually built like this, like an auditorium, but then it was rebuilt and the, and the big chambers were put in, in here. So we have one big chamber here where we can accommodate up to 20 people if you want to. But we never do that because then we would need the same amount of technicians, and they would be uh, accommodated there. And then we have a smaller chamber in here. In, in, uh, in, so it was built, all this was built like uh, flat, so we could accommodate people in the chambers for up to a week. So they could sleep there and, and, and stay there. But we never did it, but because the one time they tried to persuade people to take part of such a study, nobody wanted to be part of it. It's only astronauts that we can persuade to get, get into it. And then we have a chamber upstairs with these pyramidal um, dampers to, where, we, where we study electromagnetic fields and cognition um, with, with, uh, with people in the chamber. I'm coming back to that. So we have the large chamber, and that's around 80 square meter, uh, cubic meters. It's stainless steel, it's dairy, it's dairy uh, quality. And in Denmark, we have a long tradition for making dairies. Where all, everything from milk to plasma, we, we, uh, we can dry and, and concentrate. So it's very smooth on the inner side because it's uh, made by these skilled technicians or, or machinists. We can control the temperature from minus 20 to plus 40. And we can control the relative humidity from zero to 100%. And uh, the air that goes into this, this chamber comes from the basement beyond here, below that. We have a, I say, normally a 747 that stands there and, and controls the, the, the... And we can run that from 50 meter per cu uh, cubic meter per hour to 1500 meter cubic meter per hour. So we can shift a lot of air in that. And all that air that goes in is first dried, then it's filtered. In, and we have seven filters in the row, ending up with with the with the deeper filters two times. So we ensure that it's a it's a clean air going in, and then we rehumidify re it, and then we put on the concentration uh, in the chamber. And it goes in here from from the from the top. It goes into the chamber here, and then it's uh, it's in the chamber. Then we have the smaller chamber. It's it's only half the size. Uh, it's also stainless steel, but we can't control the ambience that much because we do not have the, the great equipment for that chamber. Uh, we can't control the temperature because the big chamber has cooling and, and heating around the chamber. In the smaller chamber, we have to, to use the air to cool and heat it, so that's a little bit less uh, versatile. And then we have a smaller machine to run the air, so it's from 50 to 80, 800 meter cube per hour. But still, uh, it's almost the same because it's half the size. Actually, the biggest problem we have is we, if we have a very costly exposure, uh, because then we have to recirculate the air. 
and, and we can't go beyond 50 meter cube per hour. So what, that's one, uh, one and a half air exchange per hour. So Ivanerson and his group, they started working with formaldehyde and they did a series of studies uh, in this chamber, finding that they, they saw um, no effect of, of uh, the very low, uh, they suggested actually uh, um, a, a low effect the level of 0 0.25, 0 0.24, uh, but it ended up with 0 0.15 milligram per meter cube, and that has actually been used all over the world until now as, as a standard for uh, formaldehyde indoor. And that was the, how these were created for the low exposure end with human exposures because we wanted to check, uh, we wanted to be able to check if the standard limit values were okay for people staying in the environment. And that's often something that not, is not done that, that, that much. So I will start with a, with a study, so we had an uh, EMF. So we had this radio chamber and we studied two times. Uh, we, um, the first one was on, on uh, all normal cell phones. Uh, um, and um, what was behind this? Was there public and then political concern? Uh, this is 10 years ago, and we had a lot of debate about uh, uh, telephones and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the effect on people. But we had another discussion, and that started in Copenhagen, because the Copenhagen community, they put up antennas on the schools, on the public schools, and then the parents said, no way we can't have, we can't have that. They shouldn't do that. It's, it's the kids, we have them in the school schoolyard. And, and then the, 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 the people from the, <coughs> from the, elector, from the, from the this TV industry, they said, yes, but if you have the base antenna up there, the signal in the air is much smaller than if it was further away, because then the, the antenna in the telephone is, is working on idle. But the, it ended up that they had to take all these antennas down or the base stations down. So, so uh, because uh, there was such a, 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 a yeah, the fans were so angry that that was the only thing to do. So they hired out the roofs of the schools to make some money for the for the public schools, but no way according to the parents. So this is the study of the base station signal. Does it matter if the base station is there? So it's, it's a signal from the base station actually giving something. So, um, so. Um, we, we did a cognitive study and they were sitting like here so we had a person here and then you can see here's the, here's the base station and this was this was blinded to us because the people who, who, were, who were running this they were sitting in Aalborg which is 150 kilometers away controlling the exposure in the chamber so we were totally blinded towards uh, uh, towards the exposure in the chamber when, when, when it was running we had the problem that we had to wake up the technicians in Lombard before we started. In the beginning, we thought they would be on, on the spot as we had planned, but we had to, to knock them a little bit to get into that mode. Uh, and then we had 40 adults and 40 young people, uh, our lessons around 15 years of age, and we tried uh, with this U U UMTS signal, uh, which is a typical mass signal in Denmark, and then a sham exposure, no antenna signal. And of course they couldn't see, it. there was no sound, there was nothing. It was just the room. The only problem we had with the exposure was the confined space. Some people didn't like to be beyond that shut door and, and shut out from everything because we have no windows in that. So we had to uh, put up a, a small camera so we could talk to people in the chamber if they had problems. And these are the, 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 the base tests that we did. Uh, we wanted to uh, assess the effect of this low-intensity radiation, and um, the primary hypothesis was that this is reducing the speed. So the trial making was this one was our primary goal to have people see how fast they could uh, follow a track signal, um, and um, this is uh, how it was set up. Just showing our instrumentation. There was a lot of technical stuff in there to, to keep it as it should be and to measure it during the, the exposure. And here you can see the results. This is the, this is the, 
this is a uh, rapid visual uh, processing. So this is the tracking of a signal. You can see there's a small difference between the adult uh, and, the, and the adolescent uh, when we have control for learning because it came out that the major thing in that uh, test is actually learning. There's an enormous learning curve for these types of tests, so we have to control for that. And after that we found this difference between uh, adolescent and, and uh, adult people in the chamber, but also between UN, UT, UMTS and, and, and SHAM, but it was, not, it was only borderline significant. So our conclusion from that study is that there's no uh, severe cognitive effect on, on, on adults, but there might be a signal on, 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 the, on, the, on the adolescent. You see, they're a little bit lower. And we actually suggested to do a test on younger children also, but we never got funding for that. So here again, you have this between the adults and the adolescents. Here, it's, it's, it's a. Could the subject ever identify whether it was on or not? Nobody could see that. We could. We could. <coughs> like they, by sensory, some the yeah. headache. You had. Oh, no, you mean if they felt it? Yeah. Did they? Feel no, it? we had no. We had nothing that would be associated with the exposure in the chamber. We found really nothing. So it was a negative study, like many of our, some of our other studies also. Um, so this is uh, what we said, is generally we see no result, nothing, and they didn't reveal to us that they had problems. And we had this near significant finding for the adults versus the adolescent. And this probably um, is worth looking into. From this one, we went on to study the CETRA signal. This is the emergency telephones used by military and, and uh, firefighters, policemen, during, uh, during disasters. So, because we expect or suspect that the mobile antennas they will be taken out during a, a, a disaster because everybody would try to get to the, to the, with a telephone. So, there's another system going around that. And they have a, they have a stronger signal. So, we, uh, we, we made this, uh, this is actually, this is the telephone. So this is the study of the, what would happen with the telephone uh, when, you, when you do this. So uh, this is the construction. And uh, we had a little LED light on it. So they were feeling it would, it would be on or not on. So they could see when it was on. But they, nobody knew the signal. Because that was also controlled from 150 kilometers away. Uh, so And again, we we're looking at the cognitive function, reaction time, and memory. Uh, uh, in this exposure, and that's really critical if you're in a disaster control. You, know, you have to be ready to respond and to understand the information. So that's why we, we did this study. And again, we use the same outcomes. And, and here you can see the, the trial making and the RTI and the reaction time, and we basically saw nothing. So this signal is not enough to, to, uh, to, to diminish the, the cognitive results. But it's stressful. The policemen, big, full-grown policemen, came in and they were shaking because they had to, to produce good every time. <laughs> so they were really, they were really like, uh, they had a high pulse when they came into the chamber just because of this, uh, they were asked to, to perform good. So they, they were actually competing with themselves all the time. Like, was it good today? <laughs> but that was the only, the signal we had, that was a stressful event that, that they were testing. So, we haven't been able to get funding for that, maybe because we didn't find something at these, with these studies. Uh, but we're, I'm going to talk about Hofstra's now for the next 15 minutes, I think. Uh, so, you see, we have had Hofstra's uh, with glucan. Glucan is some from moles and other rice, which is part of many detergents or many cleaning agents. And then we have glucan spike uh, in a house dust, in a dose response study, and then we have house dust and ozone. And this has been kind of the, the big studies that we have made now over the last 15 years. So the first study is about a combination of dust, glucans, and aldehydes. And we had this office dust spiked with glucan, spiked with aldehyde, and then we had dust alone, and as a control, we had clean air. So this is the basic setup. Four different situations and the and the and the uh, 
crossover study. So people were blinded to what they were exposed to. Um, and our worry was about the clean air. But it seems that when you have clean air and dry conditions, people actually feel that it's dust in the chamber. So, and we used a, a special instrument, which is a, 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 a read on uh, optical thing. So we, um, this is a laser doppler measurement with a, with, a, with a microscope. So we look into the nose here, and then we did laser doppler measurements of the blood flow in the concave to see if that was affected by, by the dust. Uh, and here, this is uh, the eye measurement. And, and then we have the tear and measurements of the effect on, on lung. This is diffusion capacity. So this is the, this is the day in the chamber. We took blood samples, sputum samples, uh, break up time in the eyes. We had a questionnaire, we had lung test, <coughs> skin test, uh, uh, the, the nasal test and the, with the laser doppler nasal village and, and acoustic neurology, we call that NADA. It's just a name for it, but just a measurement of the volume of the organ. <coughs> so this is basically, and you will see it again, we do that in most of our studies. These are the basic tests we have. So rhinus derometry from edema, <coughs> nasal reactivity to histamine, that was a precondition. I'm coming back to that. So we took people out before they went into the chamber and then we put Histamine on the on the concave, and then we look for the reactivity towards that, how much there was swelling, and, and if they were dripping from the nose when we did it. And by that, we could find people who had a high reactivity to, to histamine, and people who had a low uh, reactivity to histamine, and then we did the other things. And here you can see this is a change in nasal volume uh, with clean air, with uh, glucan aldehyde, and normal dust. And you can see. This is before and after, and you can see every, everybody is falling or dropping. The, the, the volume is going down, and why is it that? That's because we do the nasal lavage. When we when the lavage, the nose, the, the, the mucosa tends to swell. Up. So we are actually uh, disturbing our own signal by doing this. But by looking at the difference between clean air and look and another heart, you can see there's a difference in the reaction towards that, which is not seen for dust alone but only for these two combined exposures with dust and glucan or dust and aldehydes. Uh, and we saw the same uh, as an increase in ILA if you're correct for this cleaning of the nose by the lavage. So this is the change before and after <coughs> clean air. This is the change after glucan. So there's an increased level of ILA even if you have cleaned the nose and the same for aldehydes. <coughs> So this should be the, the baseline. So what we see is there's an increase in ILA when, when, we, when we expose people to this. And then we looked at the, the association between ILA and, and uh, volume of the nose. And you can see the more ILA coming up, up here, uh, the greater uh, effect we see on the, sorry, uh, the greater effect we see on the volume. So it goes down when we have more ILA in the, in the surroundings. And then we ask people for these questions uh, during the exposure, because we wanted to know if they were um, annoyed by the exposure. So we had a lot. Of, we have this battery of questions that we uh, have put into to, to groups, and you can see we have different groups of questions that we're pulling from these raw questions. Go, go back again, if you don't mind. <coughs> What's the left endpoint and right endpoint? What do you mean by that? It, it's a it's it's a scale that they're, they're using a ruler, so it's from zero to max. So and because we had problems, some of them were turning around, so we have to to turn them right to get them in the same direction. So a higher signal here is worse condition. Mm -hmm. um, because so it looks like there's a whole response in the irritated eyes complex, right? Yeah, we have we have we have a climate change conditions. If they're steady, if they think it's steady, then we have. Uh, um, I, I have further I just have to go to the next. Here we have them. We have environmental perception. Uh, we have this what we call irritated body perception, so, so feeling of tangling or tingling up, or in the in the in the skin. 
we have psychological and neurological effects. We have weak inflammatory responses, and then we have what we call low respiratory effects, which is chest tightness and, uh, and depression, the feeling of oppression and coughing. And then we have the constant indoor climate, because we always ask them if they feel it's the same all the time. So these are the groups we have, and, and if you take it all overall, this, is, this one is their overall reaction, so you can see that when, as soon as there's dust in the, in the air, people react. This is then the different types of dust, and you can see that there are no clear effects, and all the p-values are, are greater than <coughs> 0 0.5, 0 0.05. Uh, but if you take for these weak inflammatory effects, there seem to be, with time, an effect of the spike dust. So dust plus some chemistry seems to be worse than just dust. What was the concentration of glucan and aldehydes that you added? The, the dust was 400 micrograms, so yeah. 40 times higher than background, just the dust itself, is that yeah. right? Yeah, then, yeah. and then uh, the glucan was, uh, oh, I have to go back to the mm -hmm. slide, but I can find it. I think it was uh, one, one milligram per, per gram of dust. So. so but really quite high to anything that would normally be encountered in an office environment. Oh yeah, right. this was a kind of looking at the concept, if we could see this. So we, we chose a rather high concentration of dust. And this is also reflected here. People could feel the dust in, in, with dust only. We also had a reaction in terms of, of they, they, they sensed it. So, but it's not as high as it's been seen in other studies. We, we tried to get down to a reasonable, and our argument was that it's higher uh, than, than what you what you have, but the time is short, it was three hours or more. It was from aldehyde or a mix of aldehyde or what? what the it? aldehydes were, were not from aldehyde, from aldehyde was not part of that, because uh, what we did was we took the dust and uh, the group in Europe, they had it, and then they spiked it, they put it in a chamber with aldehydes, with not not like the water, but a vapor of aldehydes. And then they stayed with that for two weeks, and then they packed it in Teflon bags, and we got it. Uh, and we were never able to, to measure aldehydes in headspace over this dust. So we just know that the concentration in the chamber it was, um, it was uh, in before we got it was uh, 100 milligrams per meter cube. Very high concentration of aldehydes. But that was kind of sucked into the dust which is also interesting, that dust can, it's also a, a sink for, uh, for aldehydes. And we never saw that aldehyde again. We tried to get it out mm -hmm. and, and reread it, but that was not possible. So the particles were impregnated with aldehyde, it wasn't aldehyde vapor that they were... No, they were impregnated before we got them, like, like two weeks before. And yeah, the dust itself, we, uh, really, it's really a chapter in itself, because it, it was difficult to make this dust. Uh, and, and um, yeah, and then this one. This is referring to the people who had nasal hyperresponsiveness. So these people uh, are atopy, and you can see uh, there's a difference between people with hyperresponsiveness and the way they, they have signals in, in, in they refer compared to atopics. Atopics seem to be a little lower than than non-atopics, whereas the people with this Histamine uh, hyperresponsiveness in the nose, they seem to react more on the dust when they're exposed to it. And uh, that's for this uh, environmental perception, they feel it, uh, they feel the irritation, they have this uh, like headache more than other people. And then they have these weak inflammatory responses uh, that they prefer when they're exposed to this dust compared to, to people who are not being nasal hyperresponders. But the, but the people with HP, they think probably that this is nothing compared to when they have an allergy. So they kind of say this is not as, 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 as bad as it could be, because if I had, if I was being exposed to a cat, it would really be bad. This is rather nothing. And we've seen that many times with the topics that they, they kind of underestimate the conditions <coughs> of what the dust they're exposed to. The other thing that's interesting is that there's a time trend, so it seems that for, for most of the, for the ones with the, with the, the significant increase, it happens around, around uh, two hours after 
uh, we have the maximum of the, the full concentration, and then it wears out. And then there's often habituation. I, we just thought it would happen before, uh, but at least does there seem to be an increase until two hours, and then it, then it kind of wears out. Then we took, because we saw these effects, we, we did another study where we, where we spiked the dust mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and uh, here we only looked at the glucan effect, the effect of uh, glucans from, from moles, and here you can see the concentration uh, of, of dust. It's the same glucan exposure we had last time, but we just increased the, the amount of dust and we went down in, in, the, in the exposure because we knew we were high in the first round. Uh, so we, we kind of covered the area from 150 microgram per meter cube uh, up to 500 microgram uh, per meter cube. And, and 150 microgram you can encounter in, a, in an office building. Um, uh, and then we, had, we, we the feedback, the, the how we did this was we used the climate to see if we were hitting the target in the explosion. But still we have a 10% variation around the concentration we were aiming at. Uh, and we looked at bronchial have responsiveness uh, with this definition, and then we looked at pheno, which is uh, in, <coughs> in the exhaled air, uh, and we did a statistical analysis with, with the mixed model where after exposure values related to the dust. Uh, we have had a long discussion of this because how do we actually encounter the differences in the starting point? When, when you let people out of the chamber, they go out and drink beer or bicycle or go to work out, and then they come in they back two weeks later and it's not the same person. So we see a difference in the level of the starting point. So we have been discussing with the biostatisticians to, to only look at the max level that people get into. And, but here you see uh, bronchial have responsiveness. We see a, an increase in, in the, the log dose slope, as we call it, for uh, bronchial have responsiveness from, from clean air, and then with increasing the dust exposure up to, to 700. But it's not really clear in, in this end. But when we, when we um, divide people into atopics and non-atopics, and here we do not have the nasal hyper-responders, you can see that the hyper-responsiveness only goes up in the atopics, which, which makes sense because the topics are known to have hyper-responsive airways, uh, whereas in other topics we don't see that effect. Then we looked at the, the pheno, oh sorry, if we looked at the, the pheno, it was opposite for the, for the pheno, we only saw an increase in, in the NO uh, after exposure in the non -atopics. but they were running at a very low level. Uh, whereas the, 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 the atopics were running high all the time. And we've seen that before, if we, if we study atopics, some of the things that we are looking for are, are masked by their, by their hab habitual state when we, when we actually investigate them in a chamber. Um, so this is it. And, and now I'm going to talk about ozone and dust. And here you can see this is we're using the, the lower exposure for dust, 150 micrograms, and then 300 PVP of ozone, which is high. Uh, uh, and then the combination of these two. This was a pilot study we did. And here you can see what people, how people are reacting to the environment. This is, this is dust alone, this is ozone alone, and this is a combination of ozone. Here you have the time in minutes, and here you have the percent of maximum. And the first thing you can see that it's only 25% of maximum we actually see in, in or less than that that we see in the groups after exposure. Uh, but still we see an effect of, of, uh, of combined exposure to, uh, to uh, ozone and dust in eye, nose and throat irritation. So uh, mucous membrane irritation in this situation. And we also saw the day after a decrease in peak flow uh, in these people uh, with the combined exposure. So this was kind of the reason that we, we have done, we just done another study with ozone uh, and, and dust, where we want to study uh, in, a, in a bigger, so now in this study we only had eight people, 
and here we have had 20 people through the chamber. Uh, uh, and we thought that it would be nice to look at people who were uh, elderly, because uh, the, the discussion with, with the air pollution is that the 60 plus years old, they, they have, they're more afraid to air pollution than the younger part of the population, not looking into the childhood. But we have kind of the childhood uh, window and then we have the old people. So we hired people, or we, we contacted people in this age, and we ended up with people around my age, mean age of 64, uh, and they, um, they, they behave better than any of the other uh, population we ever had in the chamber. They came before time, uh, they, they rang the day before, if they had problems, they, they were really keen to be part of this problem, uh, or this project. The only problem we had was uh, two of them uh, became, uh, what do you call it? fiancés during that. So oh, during that. that. <laughs> we, we never expected that in this age group, but it happened. And, and um, then uh, Tina, our, our technician, she was called by the wife of this guy, saying, asking, is it right that you're actually asking people to stay in a hotel the night after the exposures? <laughs> and, and then Tina said, I can't talk to you about our studies. <laughs> but, but she was very insisting, and do you, do you actually pay them for it? And then she said, no, we're not paying them for it. <laughs> so, so he was not a fiancé with his wife, and that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll just jump this one. But this is how we, we measured also with Charlie Wexler, that some of you will know. Uh, uh, the, what, hap what happens when we have ozone and dust in the chamber. And this is, uh, we had a, uh, this is a GCMS with a denuder, and we looked at what's happening here with the, with the organic particles that escapes the denuder. Uh, and here you can see that it's difficult to look at. And that's the best thing I can say, but then if you, if you know something about it, you will see that these arrows are on scorines. So these are uh, oxidative products from scorines, and scorines are skin oils. And Charlie's idea, or his hypothesis, is that these skin oils are quite irritative to, to the airways when you get into the airways. So he, he believes that this is uh, what should be behind the, the possible results that we see. And, and we have done the same examination of people as we normally do, and, and we have blinded and we have randomized uh, the exposure, so we don't know what we're doing. That's why, I'm, uh, that's why I'm, I can't tell you about the, the results today, but I can show the results. And here we also did a, a new thing that we've been doing for the last uh, few years, and that's a measurement of the uh, arterial uh, agility of the small arterials in, in, the, in the periphery after occlusion. So we include the, the upper arm on both arms, uh, on one arm, sorry, and then we measure the pulse in the, in the pulp pad of two index fingers. And then we compare that result. And, and the, it's been used a lot in air pollution studies also. The, the, the time it takes for the pulse to get normal again is, is, is uh, the shorter the better. And people with, with arterial problems, stiffness we call it, they have problems getting back uh, as fast as people who are not having that problem. So, so is that used as an Change in people it's used as a, it's used in air pollution studies for an acute change with air pollution. So I do not have the results yet because they're still working on it. But it, it should be showing if they if if the stiffness is increasing with the exposure and if the stiffness is increasing, it's increasing the risk for cardiovascular incidents. And and uh, ozone and dust has been part of the discussion we have in outdoor health uh, and, and health, especially in, among the elderly. And that was one of the reasons to take them in here. Um, and here you can see, that this is, these are the phenol results, and we, the groups are still E1 to E4, uh, and I don't know which one is which, but there's a, uh, with the Friedman test, it's diff uh, significantly different with the three, four groups. Uh, laser irritation, we don't see anything. Uh, so we have the lung function here, that's between the groups, and we have the 
Fino, but I don't know for this uh, with the with the uh, arterial stiffness. Excuse me. Yeah. Could you show the results of that function again? Because I didn't have an ozone alone group also. The ozone is known to cause a decrease in that function. Yeah, so I don't know which group, but we have a group with ozone and dust, one with ozone alone, and then with dust alone and one cleaner. So, but I can't, today I can't tell you which one is which. Right, but it doesn't seem like. A no, we just see that they are significantly different. There are? Yeah, with a with frequent test. But, it's, you know, I have to do the proper analysis when I really do that. But it's blinded. For now, it's blinded. <coughs> Five minutes, I'm talking about wood smoke, and then I, I would end um, to be timely. Um, this is just the methods again. And here, this is another way of how we did it. It's parameter pheno, EBC, now, and the things I've been talking about. And then this, this arterial stiffness, we call it endopath in Denmark. I don't know what you call it in the US, but the, but the system is from Israel, and they call it endopath. It's very expensive, and it might be possible to make a, a cheaper one uh, of this uh, apparatus soon. And the symptoms, and this is uh, the pub meat, and then you have urine in this study also. These are the exposures. <coughs> Uh, up there you can see the, the mobility diameter in, in the three different situations. Uh, is that it? No, it's just going like this. Uh, you have the, the clean air situation, then you have the low exposure, then you have the high exposure. And, and here you can see with the mucosal irritation, the pe people sense it. So it, as, as, as soon as we have smoke in the air, people measure, uh, they, they sense it and they complain from it. Um, and but they do not do that for, for clean air. And this is exhaled breath compensate, where we could see an increase in, uh, in pH. On this uh, test, you uh, didn't do the hyper-responders ahead of time, you don't know. No, these are, these are all atopics. Okay. So, so we, we, we selected atopics, we put them in the chamber, and we regret we did it, because it seems that uh, the, the pheno is, is we can't see anything in the pheno because the R topics are uh, running high all the time. <coughs> and, but, and this is the irritation. You can see there's a difference between uh, these measures for environment and the initiative and inflammation, but not that much for psychological or psychoneural symptoms, probably because it's not nice to be in the chamber. And again, here we didn't see anything with the lung function. And they exhaled, and all we, 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 we failed to, to show a difference. Uh, but again, for breath compensate, we saw an increase in conductivity and pH. Uh, and we think that should be related to an inflammatory response in the airways. For heart, we saw no effect, but other people have, these are other studies, but our studies showed no effect on the heart rate variability. Um, and we also did a lot of studies with the blood bank because they were interested to see changes in inflammatory markers and, and, and uh, correlation markers during these tests and uh, it, we didn't, we, we failed to show any difference between the people. Uh, and then they now say that that can, can be relating to the fact that people are atopic. We get atopic people are different from, from normal. So the conclusion was we only see a mild inflammatory response <coughs> and these parameters um, and the limited systemic systemic effect. Uh, um, so, yeah, let's come back to the, the limitation of these studies that we're making. So, the key features of our studies is that they are human experiments, they are short, and we have only a few subjects in there. So, uh, the problems are they're expensive and uh, that best exposure is only close to, uh, to a real life situation and they're only short term. The pro is that uh, we can study mechanisms, we can perform invasive measurements, precise characterization of the subjects and, and the exposures and we can include this non-exposed situation which is actually difficult to create in the, in the, in the normal life and then we can use the RCT paradigm to study these effects. And this is the group at home.
So I'm ready to take any questions. Thanks. might be the target of like low exposure. I always say when I'm teaching toxicology that for environmental issues you should look at the frail part of the population. We thought when we took the children in or the adolescents into the UNF, they might be the most susceptible. And we are we're trying to get into the children for that reason. The other one is a is a is a exposure time. And it's it's a, really difficult to get people in once four times. So to get them in more days four times would probably be prohibitive for a study. But we are discussing it. Yeah? Oh, so a second um, question is... Uh, 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 done before you up there. Oh, I'm sorry. And it's also related to EMF. And it's a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was wondering, even if you don't see the effects among firefighters or other people, um, but if we use their labor-intensive task as a baseline, would they actually become more susceptible to the influence of EMF? For example, a lot of uh, firefighters they do wear the personal protection equipment, and the PPE is not comfortable to be in. And so, would that actually increase their um, like response to a uh, increase in the EMF? It would actually uh, decrease their ability to hear because there would be noise around them and, and it would be, uh, they would be equipped with protective gear, so it's difficult to get a clear conversation. So that way they would be deliberate, uh, debilitated in the way they, they communicate. But for cognition, I think our, our situation was quite good and they were very stressed, so they were, they were having the stress that you were kind of alluding to. But, yeah. Your studies were done at rest. Uh, did you explore nose versus mouth breathing and the effects of uh, exercise and increased ventilation? I mean, ozone is the typical example of that, where the yeah. lowest levels of ozone to which people were responded were exercising people breathing by mouth. Exactly, and uh, we, we didn't do it because we wanted to do studies without this exercise, because we, had, we were thinking that it was kind of a, an extra load of people. And with, because if you're sitting in, a, in an office landscape, you would actually think that people are not working that hard. So we, we, choose, we have chosen this and we are getting this question. It's a very good question because most of the things that have been shown with also is an exercise. So yeah, we have been discussing, but we haven't done it. Even apart from exercise, just mouth versus nose yeah. breathing, if you're talking more. With the, the atomic, um, we, 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 because we do mouth that, at yeah. night. <laughs> we, right. What, what we do is that we, um, when we do the nasal lavage, we actually clean the nose in all people. And, and then we see that they are, actually, they are able to breathe through the nose. And, but we don't control it because we, uh, but we have films of it, so we can go back to it. Uh, but they're all, we have no, what we call obligate mouth breathers in this group. They are always all able to, to breathe through the, through the nose. And we don't force it, because if we force them, they will become mouth breeders, all of them. Uh, a second question uh, is about the task exposure. I wonder if uh, you have data on the sex distribution of the task or the number of concentration. I have, I have it. Oh. Yeah, in the papers. Oh, great. But uh, so. and, and they are around 100 nanometers and bigger. So, so the, the median is around um, 0.4 micron, 400 nanometers. So I, uh, my question is, uh, if, is it possible to use smaller particles and uh, big, big particles, uh, bigger particles separately and uh, 
maybe we can see different effects? Oh yes, that's definitely possible, but that would take another type of equipment. Because what we're using is a loudspeaker. So we put the, the dust on the loudspeaker, and then the loudspeaker is kind of <coughs> putting it up to the end. Then we have a, a, an airstream going perpendicular to that, and, and that takes in. So that would create this size of the dust. We, we need to start from another position if we want to have smaller dust. But actually it's easier the smaller the dust gets. We have problems with, we are now flying houses might shit in the air, and that's really difficult because it's around 20 microns and it tends to fall down. A birch pollen are much easier, they're around, uh, around just around one micron, so they're easier to keep in the air. Yeah? I mean, it would be very interesting to see the results because there are no study in other subjects as opposed to ozone right now. There are three studies around going in U.S. just now. Yeah. One in, in the Mayo Clinic and one in California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could talk to you about one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, my question was really why did you choose ozone in the, for simulating an indoor um, situation? Uh, our argument is that we know that ozone is increasing. Uh, because of the climate change, so we want it will also increase indoor. But, and then you this one thing and the other thing that you have all these things inside creating ozone, like printers, uh, boards of, of different kinds. So we are introducing much more and more ozone into our environment. And the third thing is that we see a lot of sales promotion of dust clean or air cleaners, especially from Asia, with ozone. Uh, so they kind of sell ozonation of the air as a, as a cleaning tool. So we wanted to go into this uh, area to show that if it's good or not. So th th we had these three reasons to do it. <laughs> and then fourthly, it's, it's known from the outdoor air to be a problem. The levels were, I'm trying to remember the over DTU where they were doing simulated airplane travel, six hours in a in a mocked up uh, yeah. cabin, uh, seven rows, yeah. and a number of people across, and, and they were looking at tear film breakup yeah. and, and nasal swelling. But their ozone levels were, I think, 60. You were 300, right? Yeah. Was there an issue of actually doing those? It would, I mean, I don't, I think we'd be hard pressed to design a study and do it at those high levels in the United States, right? Uh, the argument was that it's it's not extremely high seen from some of the, the episodes we have, and the time is short. The exposure time is short. Well, obviously, you convinced the IRB. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we have, yeah, yeah. So have you thought about some of your cognitive tests while you're doing the ozone? And no, we didn't do that because we were looking for more hot data. But we, sorry, we do that all the time, but we haven't processed them. The, the, all the same data, we, all the same questions, they go through that. We, this is the standard questions we have when we're running tests in the, in the chambers. So we have them. But the questions like when you did the EMF, you had them do this at Cantab battery. Cantab we haven't been using. So what are the questions you're talking about? There's these batteries of tests that I showed you. The, the, this this long list of, of questions. Uh, but it's not the computer-based task. It's a slider. So they're getting yeah, asked, right. but then they slide this, and they have to do it every half hour. Right, I forgot what the more cognitive, were there cognitive or, or mental health ones in there? There were I mean, mental health ones, it was not cognitive. Right, right. So the cancer we only use for the EMF studies. Yeah. We actually rented this, it's really diff uh, expensive. expensive right yeah. Now. I, I just want to go back to the EMF question again, then going back to the issue that, that initiated really some of yeah. the studies with the parents. And I was wondering both how you chose the outcomes that you did, whether they addressed sort of parental concerns or not. You know, and so whether, you know, you know given that you ended up with a, a, a essentially a null result, did, would that have ever satisfied parents and, and changed the decision if they had that knowledge? I think that environmental medicine is always humping or limping behind the problem. So it takes a year to make this. So we had no intention to, to influence the discussion. Mm. 
we be, and we also starting when they were taking down the antennas. It takes time to get the money. But, yeah, and, and then what we did was that we, we, we had a group, we, we, we are a group of psychologists, psychiatrists, people are working with cognition and actually hypnosis also. And, and then we as an as a environmental team, and we, we found, they found, the psychologists, that the, the, this track would be the best way of measuring this mm -hmm. because it was, the cancer is, is used by these people in many different situations. So they wanted us to use that one as the primary outcome. Uh, but one of the one of my co-workers in all, uh, he has been working with hypnosis and and reaction in the skin, and as histamine reaction is decreasing when you are in love, when he in, in, induces love in people, and it increases when he in, induces rage in people. So there's a <laughs> direct influence of your mood on how you react on, in the skin, which is really interesting. Yeah. There was a similar situation actually in Lexington, Massachusetts, yeah. where uh, it was a school and right next to it was a church and they wanted to put a cell phone transmitter. And the way they settled it was they uh, hired people to measure exposures to electromagnetic fields um, and they put them throughout the town and then turned this, the, including the school, and then turned the cell phone transmitter on and off and there was no difference. And in fact, what they discovered was that everywhere in town, we all live yeah, in the sea yeah. of Vienna. So I think, I mean, it seems like the weight of evidence is really that uh, there's really no good physical basis yeah. uh, for EMF. It's very different than ionizing radiation, unless it's so intense that it creates yeah. localized heating. Yeah. But, the, but, but it all never this, uh, yeah. quite goes away, but I'm, yeah. I, I, don't, I think there's very little... I think uh, it was very, very ingenious to do that measurement with and without, right, because right. We, the, the authorities in Copenhagen, they said, there's no radiation, but that was not enough. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> radiation everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. the other interesting thing is these parents, they wanted the school to move, and so they weren't concerned about kids walking or driving, uh, you know, so the whole relative risks, you know, they were accepting huge risks in transporting yeah. their kids by cars, and, yeah. but in, which were, uh, yeah. has to be orders of magnitude lower than EMF, which yeah. is yeah. zero or close to zero. I'm, I'm, when I'm teaching this subject, I'm using this as an example, and I say this is an example of the two dimensions of risk, uh, the, the outrage or the indignation and the measurable risk. And here we have no measurable risk but a lot of indignation. And if you have that, somebody has to be done. That would be the, 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 the quest from the public. And what I tell Deborah is, you know, yes, cell phones are really dangerous, but uh, the biggest health effect is uh, texting and using your cell phone while you're driving or walking or on your bike. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's huge. It's a social uh, thing so around it. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick follow-up question about the Lexington work, because I remember that whole story uh -huh. when it came up. If having gone to all that trouble, do you think that the findings from that work influence other communities? I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't think it was publicized that well. But right. Yeah, it was a, the elite private, well, the Waldorf school, which is around the world, and those parents were very concerned. Yeah, yeah. yeah but exactly. this, this test that they did uh, did resolve the issue, and the Unitarian Church is making money by having a transmitter in a steeple. Okay, <laughs> so you, you made this. <laughs> okay. It's beaming up to the heavens, though. Right. Yeah. Right. Directly. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the, the uh, re histamine responders. What do they go on to react more? In some <coughs> ways, right. The background for this was that in in, in Sweden, in in the study in Europe, they they saw that when they remediated the school, they were looking for this uh, they, because they were interested in those. So they looked for the high responders, and they found that they were they were overrepresented in the people with problems in that school. Then they. Then they read the school and nothing happened. They were still complaining. And they were still being hyper responders. And then they redid uh, re the survey five years later. And slightly the, the symptoms were going down. And then the people who were used to be hyper responders, they were not that anymore. So they had this, this um, hypothesis that, that, that hyper responders is something that you can have, become, and then it can wear out over a very long time. So they are prone to have more effects. And therefore, we look for it before we... Well, you think it's a preconditioning of being in a bad environment and uh, now... That was the hypothesis, but nobody else has 
except that one has seen that in the world. So it's, it might be a, just a weird situation. But your hyperresponders, did you, you did repeat measurements oh, of yeah, them? Yeah, so they yeah. stayed at yeah. an intent, a more reactive state? Yeah, but we only had them for, four, uh, for 12 weeks. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's a short, short time to, to look for it. And they had no symptoms of it, so it was just a, a condition that was. But the, the idea of the people in Sweden was that you could induce that people. Like you can induce hyper-responsiveness in the airways. When I, if I meet a cat, I'll be hyper-responsive for the next two weeks. Because well, from a, from a short-term exposure yeah. to a cat. Yeah. Right. And if I get a cold, I'll have the same. And that's, that's known, but nobody has really been looking at the nose in this respect. Well, uh, how, what percentage of the population? Because you weren't selecting yeah. on that; you just happened to have some, right? Didn't we you? were not selecting on that. Yeah. yeah. So it was. Um, it, they are hyper is hyper being presented in your topics. So it was difficult to find the topics who were not this. Okay. So they are. It's it's part of this hyper sensitive uh, mucosa in people with AIDS, I think. And A to B from skin reactions? We, we, our test was uh, ten, no, uh, 10 most prevalent uh, aero allergens. Okay. So that's the definition of them being atopic. Yeah. So, so the more. people in what I showed you were pe people who were nascent hyper responders, and the other ones were atopics without that. So in the group of hyper responders, 60% were also atopic. So that's, that's a very okay. good question. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, but the prevalence in the total population, if atopic people are, what, 20% or so of the population? 30% in Denmark. 30% of the population. Yeah. It's leveling around 30% now. Wow. And I think it's the same over here. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, any other questions before? Yeah. I just want to make a comment. There was a study by Bia Sanchez many years ago who did um, uh, exposed to these uh, particular diesel exhaust in the nose, uh, and he found in a topic such as he found an increase in IL-8 and IL-6 uh, yeah. in the nose. Yeah. Um, so th there is uh, this was the stress suspended particles versus, yeah. versus uh, is better in a way as yeah. an exposure system. So there is some. Yeah, we are actually using in other studies the nose as the we just put things in the nose of people. Yeah. We, then we just use the chamber for as a clean air condition, but then we expose people in the nose, and that's a very neat way of doing it. Mm -hmm. You get the answer very fast. They start. They start sneezing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for coming. That's great. Thank you.